So welcome, welcome again, welcome to the MBLUX review course. My name is Jody Skulls. I'm your instructor uh, during your journey, our journey together of preparing for the MBLUX, the Massage and Bodywork Licensing Exam. Uh, this is such a test, woo! So we're gonna take a couple of minutes right at the start of our session to talk about um, what is this MBLEX? Um, you know, what, uh, what's it all about? That's part one of our, um, of our class time. We spend a few minutes just getting to know that test because here's the truth, you guys. Yes, you can go in there armed with a ton of knowledge, but the truth is you gotta know how to take a test. And so we're gonna talk about how to take that test today in our first segment. Then today we're gonna to be talking about anatomy. We're gonna go over a lot of anatomy. In fact, this class feels more like I would teach it um, in school than I would like in a review class. Typically we keep it a bit light, um, but uh, I dug in and, and, uh, and found some slides that were prepared for medical students. And you know, I picked the ones that worked for us. So we're going for it today in upper body anatomy. Um, and then in the final segment of our class, we're gonna go ahead and dissect some questions. Um, gonna demonstrate to you how to dissect um, the questions so that you'll have this tool in your toolbox for when you're taking your exam. Because inevitably, if you've taken a practice exam with me in the online learning center, inevitably, you know, there's a question that comes that is like, what the actual hell does that mean? It, it is like, I like <laughs> we were talking uh, just before class started. Um, I was looking at an exam and I'm like, oh yeah, the AC joint. What is that AC joint? <laughs> I was like, hmm. Oh, yes. Okay, good. Glad. So we're going to actually walk through um, dissecting some questions. And even when you have no idea what the answer is, how to eliminate wrong answers, answers you know are wrong, and also um, how to get to the best answer. So that's our class for today. Three parts. We're going to talk about the MBLEX itself, do quite a bit of learning, and then dissect a few questions. So let's get started. First and foremost, I, I wanted to talk about the MBLEX itself as a test. And you know, there's, people have so many different opinions, right? I mean, our instructors were like, yeah, we love this test because, um, you know, it's, um, it's hard and, and, you know, if every, you know, we don't want just anyone becoming a massage therapist. Um, and so what we get to do with this test is, we get to embrace it. It's a tough test. It is. Um, and it, as, as you've seen in your practice exams, these questions are way beyond what we're going to need to know in the treatment room. It uses languages, language that uses words and language that we are not going to, um, that we're not going to use in the treatment room. And it seems Ironic, right? That um, we've got to learn all this stuff that we're not actually going to use. Well, part of what this test is for is for public safety. And so we are establishing a bar that is more than um, entry level. It's the truth. This is not an entry level test. It's our entry level test as massage therapists, but in general, it's not an entry level test. So you can stamp your feet and throw a temper tantrum. Um, and if so, if you need to do that, go for it, get it out of your system because to be successful, we have to embrace this test. Once you pass it, then you can piss and moan if that's where you wanna be, if that's where you wanna hang out. Okay. And there are times, honestly, I do piss and moan about this. I, I you know, I would love to see it go away. Um, I promise I, this is going out to the public today. And, you know, I would love to see it change. I would love to see an, an alternative like the NCBTMB, you know, the National Certification Board used to have a, uh, a certification exam, an entry level. Now the National Certification Board has an advanced 
exam that you can take to become board certified. I'm not sure if you're aware of that. Um, and that's something that I would encourage you to do. Um, I would encourage you to consider taking the national certification exam for the board certification. Um, why? Because it looks good. That's about it. I mean, aren't a lot of perks, aren't a lot of bells and whistles associated with this. It's extra money, but you know what? It looks good. So on your LinkedIn profile, on your website, on your business card, you get to say board certified. But you can only take that now after you are already licensed. So I wanted to just address the mindset today towards the Amblex because when we do, sometimes we do this with the universe. We say, yes, 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 I wanna pass the test, right? Yes, bring it, bring me my blessing. Bring it, bring it, bring it. And then we say, oh, this test is unfair. Uh, this test um, is not entry level. Uh, you know, and what we do is we block our blessing. We say, yeah, 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 I'm going to study. Yeah, 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 I'm going to study. And then with our mindset, we've got this false belief that it's not fair. Or this false belief that we're going to get questions we can't answer. You absolutely can answer every question on that test. I promise you, you can. Yeah. Bring it. Tell the universe, tell yourself that you're ready. You're ready for your blessing of passing this test. And by doing so, we talk positively. Look, if you've been in this class, you know, even for the last 10 minutes, you know that this, my opinion of this test. But here I am, right? Here I am making sure that I do my part for people just like you to not only have the knowledge, well, to get the knowledge, right? To, to relearn or learn um, the knowledge base that's gonna support you in passing the test, but also preparing your brain, preparing your mindset, preparing your heart space because every one of you here has compassion for your colleagues, for, your, for the other graduates in the room, right? In the Zoom room, you've got massive compassion for them because it's like, son of a gun, we gotta do this. <laughs> yeah, and we're gonna do this. Um, now I will mention also in the few minutes here that um, I would like you to strongly consider taking that test. Some of you already have your test date. That's awesome. I would like you to strongly consider going ahead and registering to get your authorization to test. When you get your authorization to test, you pay the money, right? You go online, pay the money. And in two or three days, you get a notice, um, email notice that says, hey, you're authorized to test. And you can call the Pearson View Testing Center and set up your date. Why am I encouraging you to do that now? I would really like you to get certified. Oh, yay, Lynn's waiting to hear, yay. Um, I would really like you to take your test in the next 90 days. Where we are right now, I know people are listening to this at different times and different places and in different dates, but where we are right now, we're about 90 days from the end of the year. Boom, how cool would it be? You know, yesterday was Yom Kippur. It's for our, our, for our, the people who follow the Jewish faith. That's New Year's Day. It's a high holy holiday. It is a big, big deal. Think about the energy of the new year, right? That's the energy we're in right now. Whether you choose to practice you know, the, the Jewish faith or another faith, we get the benefit of the new year, the Yom Kippur, right? Yay. Oh, Betsy's got a test date. Some of you already have your test date. I'm so excited for that. Um, and I want you to kind of feel like what it feels to go over the finish line. And I'd love for you to do that before the end of the year. So that is my challenge to you, my invitation to you um, today to, um, to consider uh, going ahead and registering and getting your authorization to test. Once you have the authorization, you don't have to call right away, but it's, a, it's something you can do when you're ready. So.
just having that done, you know, check the box. And for some of you, it's going to be the third or the fourth or the ninth time you're taking this test. And I'm sorry. I'm sorry that it's been that challenging. But you got this. You got this. Now, I'm getting a lovely notice that says my internet connection is unstable. Oh, well. So if I freeze, go ahead and stick something in the chat and I'll, uh, I'll reboot. I'll... Uh, I'll turn off my camera and, and get that uh, situated. So, all right. So, yay, Sandy. Woo, nice. Coming right up. I love it. Great. Um, okay, good. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, so, um, that is the Emblex. The, my, my coaching on the Emblex for today is to stay positive to stay positive in your mind about this because you are gonna pass this test. You are, eventually. It may not be on your first try, that's okay. But we are gonna stay positive about it. Once we pass, then we can have a, an opinion one way or the other, right? Um, and so um, stay positive for now. Know that you are going to pass this. You are. It's, it may not be the first time, but eventually you will pass this. It's okay. I mean, as I've stated before, you can put your hands on bodies. You can accept tips. You can accept you know, a gratuity that is a recommended gratuity. You know, keep your hands on bodies. Keep your mindset positive as you, um, as you continue your studies and you continue uh, with the classes. All right. Yay. Okay. Let's go ahead and get into our content for today, which is the uh, anatomy. Um, of the upper body. All right. And here we go. Her slideshow from the beginning. There we go. All right. So this is our upper extremities. Let me make sure I'm on the right presentation. Yes. Okay. Very good. So all right. So this, I want to say a nice thank you out to Dr. Sunil. Um, he uh, shared these slides on a, um, on a site called SlideShare. And uh, we, we have some formatting issues. I'm a little bit of a perfectionist when it comes to my slides. Um, so I apologize in advance uh, for those uh, formatting issues. However, um, it's really good information. So. Thank you, Dr. Sunil, for all your hard work in putting these together. We're gonna to jump right in. All right, so the boundaries of upper limbs. So this is what we're gonna be talking about today. So we're gonna be talking about the superior boundary. Um, so that's the clavicle, the acromion, um, the spinous process of C7 is up in here. That is actually going to be our boundary. Um, the acromion process, the clavicle, You'll see all of these, and again, the anterior border, um, deltoid, uh, the axillary fold. Where is the axilla? Mm -hmm. You can feel free to put these things in the chat. Yeah, yeah, go, go. All right, what's the axilla? Mm -hmm. It's a fancy word for? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm seeing some answers come in. Yep, exactly, the armpit, yes, the armpit, the axillary fold, posterior border, uh, is the deltoid, and the posterior axillary fold, the scapula uh, as well, we'll see some, we're just going through the anatomy, kids, this is, this is what it is. All right, the bony structures of your upper limb, these are, these are uh, things you do need to know, all right. Let's take a look here from the start. The clavicle, right? Touch your clavicle. Palpate your clavicle. Also known as the collarbone, right? Clavicle, collarbone. Scapula, flat bone on the back, on the shoulder, on the shoulder, also known as the shoulder blade. The humerus is the upper uh, long bone of the upper arm. We've got a radius and an ulna. So the radius is the lower part of the arm. So the radius is thumb side. Our radius is on the thumb side. Our ulna is on the pinky side. 
We have carpal bones, we have metacarpals, and we have phalanges. We're gonna go into a little bit more specific detail on these in just a moment. So, oh, also in our picture here, you'll see we've got the, the glenoid cavity. The glenoid cavity is really that shoulder joint. So right where that ball and socket go together, so the socket is called the glenoid cavity. You'll also get some glenoid fossa in there, right? So the fascia, the fossa is also, it's the lining of that um, glenoid cavity. And here you can see the anterior view of the scapula. So we're looking through the body, right? Um, all right. So bony structures of the upper limbs. Let's, let's take a closer look. Here's that clavicle coming across, across. This is the coracoid process of the scapula. So take a look. So see this thing here? That's part of the scapula. And here it is in the front. We can see it in the front. So the coracoid process of the scapula, the collarbone is the clavicle, and this is the acromion. So it's a corner, the acromion. Um, and so the AC joint, the acromion uh, clavicular, AC joint is right here between the collarbone, that bony part on the end of your collarbone, or at the shoulder now, right? And two pieces of the scapula. So the coracoid process and the acromion, so the corner, the upper corner. So this, if you were looking at the scapula, is farthest away from the spine. So if we look back here, farthest away from the spine. The spine is here. All right, so this is your AC joint. Now, if you have a question about the AC joint and it's talking about the radius or the ulna, or the phalanges, or the sternum, or the spine, right? They're not involved. But the scapula is intimately involved. Those, those three parts here, the coracoid process, the acromion, and the clavicle make up the AC joint. All right. Let's take a look at that scapula. All right. So the scapula uh, is usually covering your second rib to the seventh rib, it's flat. Um, it looks like mm, a triangle sort of, right? So if this, the glenoid cavity was the pointy part of the triangle, it would go out, out and be flat here. We've got the, the lateral border. Let's see if we can move us over, there we go. So the lateral border here. Um, and so let's just talk about that. So we have the anterior surface, which is the costal surface. So the anterior of the scapula sits on the ribs. Another word for the ribs are the costals, right? Do you remember intercostal muscles? Where are those? Where are the intercostal muscles? Mm hmm yeah, you know, you know. Tell me, tell me, let me see. Stick it in the chat if you're able, yeah. I like it. Yes, Betsy, yes. Yes, yes, yes. You got it, in between the ribs. So those intercostal muscles, right? They assist with breathing. So the anterior surface of the scapula is the costal surface. So that surface that's touching the ribs. The dorsal or posterior, so dorsal. Remember the dorsal fin of a dolphin, right? Right, right? the dorsal fin of a shark on the dorsal at, uh, side of our foot. So the dorsal or the posterior surface. So if we were laying prone and there was a fin on our scapula, that would be the dorsal, right? Okay, uh, so the dorsal, the posterior surface of the scapula. So we've got a superior border, a medial border, show me the medial border. Yes, this is the medial border here. Sorry, I was pointing it out as the lateral border before. This is the medial border, which is closest to the spine. And then our lateral border is actually lateral, right? So out towards the shoulder, this is where the shoulder joint is gonna be. The arm is here, out here. So this is our lateral border. 
and our medial border is closest to the spine, right? Medial is always closest to the spine. We've got a superior and an inferior angle. So superior, inferior, right? Superior angle up here, closest to the spine. So on that, on that, just as you turn the corner, right? So here's the spine and just as you come out. So you could probably almost touch it. Yes. All right. And then the inferior angle refers to that bottom edge. So if the side of the scapula that is closest to the spine is considered the bottom of the triangle, right? We, um, we're looking at it here as the inferior superior. So the head superior, the butt, the feet inferior, toward, closer to the, towards the feet. Uh, the, as we saw, the acromion articulates with the clavicle. Um, and so the acromion articulates with the clavicle that you can't see here. Articulate means that it has a joint. So when we articulate something, we're explaining something, right? Well, welcome to English. In this, in scientific jargon, uh, articulate means it has a joint. Uh, the glenoid cavity articulates with the head of the humerus. So yeah, so the glenoid cavity is the socket, right? The head of the humerus goes right on in there. The coracoid process projects upward, provides attachment point for muscles and ligaments, right? So the coracoid process, again, we've seen, it's a part of the scapula. Yeah, I know. All right, very good. So you can see the outline here of our scapulas, second to seventh rib, um, medial borders closest to the spine. And I take the time to review this with you because it will help you understand questions, right? You may be like, got it, got it, got it. You got it. All right, so in your head, you're gonna to get to imagine this when you get a question about an AC joint, about a coracoid process. You're like, coracoid process, is that part of the elbow? It's an upper limb, it's part of the scapula, okay? All right, moving along. Let's take a look at the humerus. There are different ways to describe the humerus. It's the longest and the largest bone of the upper body. Yeah, um, it has two ends, distal and proximal, right? Where is proximal? The proximal end of the humerus, and this, is it the head or is it the epicondyles? Which is the proximal end? So when we have long bones, we talk about distal and proximal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know you're waiting to answer, go ahead. Um, this, uh, this bone has, um, two ends. Yep. Yes. Thank you. So thank you, Allison, for being brave. Yes. It is the head. The head of the humerus is the proximal end distal, right? So if it's my arm proximal, distal. So the distal, we have a distal end of the humerus. The distal end of our arm is the wrist, the hand, right? but we do have a distal end of the humerus. It's at our elbow. So um, the head has a greater and a lesser tubercle. A tubercle is a bony landmark. So it's a bump on the bone and it serves for uh, a muscle point, a tendon or a muscle point or an attachment point. Um, so the, it has a greater and a lesser tubercle. So does our hip bone, so does our femur, right? So it has a greater and a lesser tubercle, and it has a bicipital groove. I believe that is gonna be your bicipital groove right there. Yep, right in there. And that's the home of the bicipital tendon, right? Very good. So we've got a capitulum for the head of the radius, right down here, you can see the capitulum. Again, capitulum, it's the head, but I'm going over these words just in case they happen to be in your test questions. Um, so the capitulum is on the end of the radius. Uh, we've got a trochlea for the articulation with the trochlear notch of the ulna. So that's over here on the ulna. So there's a little notch right in here. Yep. Uh, we've got radial fossa, radial fossa for the radial head when the elbow is flexed. So when the elbow flexes, that's the, the fossa. I'm surprised I didn't put in the, the glenoid fossa. 
Um, but the fossa is the is the smooth stuff. It's fascia, but it's not it's not exactly fascia. It's fossa, um, but it's the smooth stuff that allows that bone that head to groove within its socket, and in this case, to um, in its hinge joint because the elbow is a hinge joint. And so the, also we have the olecranon fossa, uh, fossa posteriorly uh, for the olecranon process. So olecranon fossa, can we see the olecranon? We can't see it, can we? Yeah, so what is the olecranon? Hmm? There's no L in there, O-L-E, cranon, olecranon. Remember where that is? I see answers coming, hint, hint. Let's see. Yes, it's your elbow. Yes, good. Um, yes, good. All right. So very good. Thank you. Good to see you, Charla. Um, all right. So the electron is um, so that's the fossa. Again, it's this, it's the slippery stuff within the cavity, right? It's in here. And it allows that joint to move. All right. Let's take a closer look at the radius and the ulna. Um, so the electron process is right? Pointing into your elbow. Um, and it has some fossa in there for the hinge joint. Um, these are, so you'll see the radius is just slightly smaller um, than the, um, than the ulna. The ulna is just a little bit bigger. And some people it's a lot bigger, but normally we see um, the radius just a little bit smaller than the, the ulna. Uh, and these are all, you know, terms uh, in between the radius and the ulna there's something called the interosseous membrane. This is so yummy to massage. Oh, do you do gliding strokes down the forearm? Oh, divine, absolutely divine. Yes, and um, we have interosseous membrane between our tibia and fibula as well. This is where shin splints happen in the tib-fib. So it's, a, it's a, an inflammation of this interosseous membrane. It starts to pull away a little with shin splints. Um, we're gonna be looking at tennis elbow and golfer's elbow differently. The interosseous membrane is not involved in that at all, um, but it is involved in shin splints. Um, there are very few people who get inflammation or um, injury to their, um, their interosseous membrane in the, in the forearm. Um, I guess it can happen. It's just not that common, but lovely, lovely, lovely to massage. Very, very nice, very relaxing. Uh, so these are just the different names of the parts of the bone. You've got the head of the radius, right? That's that round, that round part. So radius, remember I have the radius around the earth, right? So it's round, like a radius, like a circle. All right. Uh, and then uh, opposite end, um, so this is the wrist end, um, this is the siloed process, which it, where it touches um, the carpal bones. All right, this is the ulna, same type of thing. We've got the head of the ulna here. Good, and these are the distal ends of these bones. So the ones that are near the wrist. Let's take a look at the carpal bones. I, uh, if you wanna memorize them, you can. Um, but uh, this is what I was talking about with the formatting issues. I could not fix this. It's making me cuckoo. Um, but uh, in any case, uh, so we've got eight carpal bones uh, and you can see them colored here. I'm gonna, the next diagram identifies them with their name by color. But I just wanna see you to see how they're stacked up. Um, so the scaphoid um, is the boat shaped, uh, the lunate, is the half moon. Let me go ahead and just go ahead and show you these. The scaphoid is in this, this orange color. So he says it's a boat shape. Mm, I guess so if this is the top of the boat. Um, the lunate is down here. These are the two that articulate um, at the wrist. And then we've got six more. Uh, this is the one that starts with T, the triquetrum. Um, piece of form, we hear about that one, right? So this is um, pinky end. Pinky end, piece of form. The most common injury of fracture is the scaphoid. That's the one that's most commonly injured. Um, but we got the trapezium here. We've got a trapezoid in here. We've got the cap pit date and the hamate. So 
Again, I have not memorized all these, but you may see them on the test. So we are reviewing them. Uh, and you can go back. I'm happy to um, upload this picture as well with the video so you can have this for reference. Let's take a look at the bones of the hands. Um, it looks like this is, you can't see the bottom, but so we've got the phalanges. So the phalanges are also your toes, right? So the ends of our fingers, the, the, our fingers are our phalanges. We've got the metacarpals, which are in our hands. And then we have the carpals, which make up our wrist. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about um, injuries. So dislocations uh, of the elbow joint, pretty rare to be honest, um, but when they do happen, they happen usually because someone has knocked, um, it knocked, it goes posterior. Not that you're gonna be treating an elbow joint dislocation, but you might be treating someone afterwards. So uh, not that uncommon in children, but look at how they happen, right? So when a parent or someone is yanking on the kid's arm or lifting them by one, um, by one arm, um, that radial head gets pulled out. So that's, and uh, it does require medical attention. Obviously it's not like a shoulder where some people can just put their shoulder back in, right? Um, this is something that would require um, medical attention. I just wanted to bring it to your attention. It does happen now and then. I have never actually treated someone who had dislocated their elbow. So in my opinion, it's fairly rare, but I don't treat a lot of children either. Something that is not so rare is tennis elbow. And it's worth uh, looking, taking a look at again. Uh, so tennis elbow is caused by either degeneration, overuse injury, um, or which creates a little partial tear, like little micro tears um, in the uh, extensor muscles. So here we are, here's the site, um, and uh, can be from tennis, from you know playing a lot of violin, um, but it results in pain and tenderness over the lateral epicondyle. So the lateral epicondyle, remember? We are, um, let's take a look at that lateral epicondyle. I think my next slide is the medial epicondyle. It is, all right. So the lateral epicondyle, Right, so stand in anatomical position. At least put your arms in anatomical position. Let your shoulders drop. All right, so in this case, what is most lateral? Your thumb or your pinky? Right, your thumb, right? Because your thumb is sticking out, your hands are facing forward, right? So that makes the X, so the lateral epicondyle of the radius. So out here, thumb side. See in the picture, you can see just barely that it's thumb side. That is the lateral, that is tennis elbow, the lateral epiconda, all right? Compared to the medial, the medial epicondyle, again, anatomical position, what is most medial of the condyles of your elbow? right, pinky side, pinky side. So this is caused by partial tear degeneration um, of the superficial flexor muscles. So extensor muscles, the flexor muscles. And really tennis people and golf people can get either. It's how you're treating it. So this is called medial epicondylitis or lateral epicondylitis. Those are fancy names for tennis elbow and golfer's elbow. Medial pinky side, um, golf can cause it. Um, I've seen handyman, you know, people who do a lot of, of this motion, turning, um, but it results in um, tenderness over the medial epicondyle, so it's on the inside. Good, and it radiates usually down the forearm. Now, I'm gonna pause here to say, how do you treat it? You work above and below. Um, if it's in the acute stage, and what is acute? Acute, give me, give me a word or two for acute. Shereen, ask me that question after we're done and I'll talk to you about your, uh, about your wrist. 
Yeah. So pain right now. Yes. So intense. It just happened. Yes. You are in pain right now. It is acute. It is inflamed. Yes. So acute is recent onset. It just happens and it hurts now. It's acute. It just happened and it hurts now. Acute can also mean it hurts now. It Many times it just happened, but it doesn't have to be. You could have re-injured it and now the low back pain is acute. It's sharp. It's, it's hurting. So we do not treat people in, we don't treat the area of acute pain right? We, we treat around the area. Now, if it's chronic, chronic means it comes and goes, right? So, oh, you know, that low back pain, it just comes and goes. I can't really predict what well, we probably can predict, but that's another, um, another, another point of view. Chronic, mm, low grade, Chronic pain can be intense, um, but acute really does mean that it's 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 painful right now. Chronic, it's like man, it, it's, it hurts all the time. It can hurt a lot all the time, but it hurts all the time. Acute comes and goes. Usually, when you have acute pain, it's here. You know. All right. I hope that makes sense. Uh, so medial epicondylitis medial side from anatomical position, right? Golfer's elbow. We treat it by um, treating uh, by lengthening uh, the tissue in the forearms. That's the best way to treat it because it is a, um, it's a forearm issue. You can work the biceps, but not really all that involved. All right, let's take a look at the muscles that abduct the upper arm. So abduction abduction. We're going to look at both abduction and um, adduction. So go ahead and I'm going to put my arms like this. Go ahead and abduct, abduct your arms. Yes, yes, right? That's abduction, right? So we're going to look at origins and insertions here, even though I'm telling you, you don't have to learn them. We're going to look at them here just because we're going a little deeper today. Um, so the origin is from uh, the clavicle of acromion process and the spine of the scap. So on the deltoid um, is pictured here, right? So the insertion of the deltoid is into the deltoid, uh, the tuberosity of the humerus. So we just saw the humerus is here. And so it inserts into the tuberosity. The tuberosity is another name for a bony landmark. Um, and then um, it's the main muscle for abduction of the shoulder joint, the deltoid is. And that makes sense, right? As we abduct our arm. So we're taking it away from the midline of the body. And um, yes, okay. Uh, and then the other muscles that abduct the arm is called the supraspinatus. It's one of your rotator cuff muscles and here's where it lives. Uh, it is just above the spine of the scapula. So this is a picture of the scapula. This is the spine of the scapula, runs across the top of it. So here's the arm. So here's the medial border, right? So the supraspinatus, supra, so high, right? Supra versus sub, right? So supraspinatus is on the top. It's the highest of all the um, rotator cuff muscles. Uh, and you'll see here, Ooh, there we go. It stabilizes that shoulder joint um, during the abduction process. So it might as well go ahead and take a look at these other rotator cuffs. Here's the infraspinatus, it lives under the spine of the scap. We've got teres minor, one of your sit muscles. Teres major is not a, so a rotator cuff, by the way, only minor. I know, weird, right? But teres minor, because remember SITS, our acronym S I T S, supra. Spinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and the one that's not pictured here, yes, subscapularis, very good. Yeah, so teres minor is yummy to work. Oh, it's the best. If you, uh, I highly encourage you find it. You can usually find it on yourself. So 
If you grab, take one hand, grab your elbow, push it back under, so and through the armpit. And you can usually find Terry's minor on yourself. Yeah, there it is. So it's, you can pin it next to yours. So you'll know you got it because it'll hurt. So, so I'm taking my hand, pushing my arm over. All right, there's edge. See how it's here on the edge of the scapula? But practice on people. You'll know when you find it because they'll be like, ooh, ooh, ooh. And I'll tell you, it's one of the keys. Here's, here's a little secret about successful massage therapists. Ready? They are specific to be terrific. I coined that from another organization, but specific to be terrific. Get specific about something in your session. Maybe you love the Terry's Minor. Maybe you love elbows. Maybe you love forearms. Maybe you love the neck. Maybe you love the knee. Get specific about something. Maybe you love feet. Just hone in on something. Yes, we want to treat the client um, for their primary concerns, but also up the ante, get specific about something. If you're just doing long effleurage strokes and some juicy petrissage strokes, step up your game, get a little specific. You don't have to do deep tissue work. You can do specific work through fine vibration. You can do specific work through coarse vibration or cross fiber friction, but you just get specific about something. Your clients will love it. All right, so here's the muscles that abduct, that adduct. So we're moving from abduction, coming out, right, to ab adduction, adding towards the midline of the body. So we've got the pec major, touch your pec major. This is your pledge of allegiance muscle the latissimus dorsi, Terry's major, and the subscap. All right, let's take a look at that. Here's the pec. So the origin of the pec is the sternal half of the clavicle. So the sternum clavicle, see here, right here in that corner, sternum clavicle. We've got uh, the insertion point is the lateral lip of the intertubule. You won't need to know this, but just this is the insertion point here on the humerus. The actions, it adducts, it adducts the humerus, it adducts. And it also helps to immediately rotate and flexion of the shoulder. So flexion of the shoulder in this plane, right? Flexion of the shoulder, touch your pec while you flex your shoulder. Yeah, now this is pec major. Pec minor gets involved sometimes too. But that's one of the muscles that brings your arm back down to your side. The system is dorsi. So, you know, we have all seen our lats, right? The big monster muscles in the back, the system is dorsi. It's a broad triangular muscle here. Look at how big this is. This actually, the lats are underneath another muscle called your QL here, but um, it originates from lumbar fascia. That's white stuff is called lumbar fascia. It touches the last six, and typically in most humans, it touches the last six thoracic vertebrae and those lower three or four ribs. So here's T7, right? And then we get into our lumbar vertebrae. The last rib is T12, L1, L2, L3, L4, L5, sacrum. Here's our iliac crest. This is where the lumbar fascia starts. This pink is the latissimus dorsi. And it actually attaches at the humerus as well. Look at where it attaches. So there's a nice little groove here in the muscle and it attaches in there. So it makes sense why it helps to abduct the arm, right? So think about the fibers of the muscle. It brings it back in. It's not lifting it, right? So we looked at the muscles that adduct. Now we're looking at the muscles that abduct. So it's the downward, downward pull. Terry's major. 
So we see the dorsal surface again, um, inferior angle of the scap. So right here also where, um, where the teres minor lives. Ter this is the teres major though. Teres major is not in our rotator cuff muscles. Teres minor it is. Mm -hmm. All right, and the action extends the arm and from the flexed position, it adducts, medially rotates the arm, so it helps. These are, these are things that it helps with. So flexion of the arm, extension of the arm. So extension, so from anatomical position, extension of the arm, behind. Extension of the arm, flexion of the arm. So in front, in the, in that frontal plane, is that flexion of the arm, extension of the arm. We are talking specifically about abduct, abduction and adduction right now at this. So the teres major helps to adduct, bring it back in, bring it back in towards the midline of the body, right? In towards the midline of the body. Also have to immediately rotate, but yeah. All right. One more, the subscapularis. Now this is from the front. We're seeing the subscapularis from the front. Look at the clavicle. Here's the humerus. Here's where the subscap lives. And right here are where all those little trigger points are. Okay, so subscapular fossa, you know, it, it's, it lives under the shoulder blade. Subscapula, just like its name. Uh, the insertion point is the lesser tubercle of the humerus. So here we are with the humerus, and we talked about tubercles and tuberosity and epicondyles and bony landmarks, um, but the lesser tubercle, here we go, right in here. It stabilizes the shoulder. Um, it, uh, it helps to avoid um, dislocation, um, but it also supports adduction of the shoulder. That's why we're taking a look at it. And again, you can work this on yourself. It takes a minute. But you can, if you, again, help, helping your body. So taking one hand, pressing on the elbow, go ahead and, and stick, as you put your elbow up, the scapula floats out. And you can catch the ridge, right? You can just catch that ridge. See how I have a little bit of the ridge there? And if you put your fingers right in there, ooh, dog, right? Even if it's just like, maybe a five in pressure, and then drag those fingers down, almost like you're doing a little myofascial work. Ooh, yeah. Should be tender. It'll be tender on your clients too. They, and for people with chronic anterior um, deltoid issues, it's usually not their deltoid at all. It's usually their subscap isn't contributing to stabilizing their shoulder because it's got a, a big old trigger point in there. So even just a little work, Tennis players, oh golly, yeah. So on this side, you'll see little, so you can find that edge. So you can find the edge, you can put way up, find the edge and pin, pin the muscle and then stretch it down. So pin it, you don't have to poke it like I just did, but go ahead, pin and stretch. Pin and stretch. So if you only want to pin, you can move your elbow down to horizontal, 90 degrees. Pin and lift. Pin and lift. You're treating your subscapula. Oh, I know, pretty cool, right? All right, and then infraspinatus, our final uh, adductor muscle, and I just looked at our time, so we're gonna cruise into our questions next. Uh, but the infraspinatus lives just below the spine of the scap. So you see in the upper picture here, here's the spine of the scapula. Here's the clavicle, spine of the scapula. This is where the supraspinatus would live in that little, that little pocket. And then we've got the infraspinatus. So um, it has one of its uh, origins right here on the medial side of the scapula. And it attaches at the greater tubercle. So this bump out here on the humeral head is called the greater tubercle. We have a, one on our hip as well, a greater tubercle and a lesser tubercle. Again, it's just, tubercle just means bony landmark, a bump. 
all right, right here. Uh, and this also, the infraspinatus, it stabilizes the shoulders so that we can complete the abduction, so abduction. Um, it, it, it stabilizes that head of the humerus. Um, yeah, all right. And it also, also contributes to lateral rotation um, of the shoulder. So, all right. We talked about our rotator cuff muscles. So subscap, supra, infra, and teres minor. They stabilize the shoulder joint. Here's a nice little picture of those. Ah, it's now time to dissect some questions. All right. I thought I gave myself a slide to prompt me. I guess I didn't. All right, so we're gonna take just a couple of minutes, two to three minutes, um, maybe a little longer. We have, uh, I believe, four questions. So we've talked about planes of movement today. We've talked about um, some different directional movements. So the xiphoid process is blank to the navel. The xiphoid process is blank. Is it inferior, medial, distal, superior? Mm -hmm. You should see some answers popping up. All right, where's the xiphoid process? All right, xiphoid process, bottom of the sternum, xiphoid process, that little pointy part. So the xiphoid process is what? To the navel. Is it inferior? Is it medial? Is it distal? Is it superior? Oh, you guys got it. Yay, yes. The correct answer is superior. Superior, the xiphoid process is superior to the navel. So it is above, right? That's why it's not inferior, that would be below. It's not medial because they're in alignment. They're both right there in the middle. It's not distal. We use distal to describe limbs and long bones. All right. Xiphoid process again is superior, letter D, D like dog, to the navel. There's my prompt. <laughs> it was in the wrong order. All right. A short, severe episode is referred to as blank. A short, severe episode is referred to as blank. Now, let's eliminate a wrong answer on this one. Chronic, acute, terminal, minute. So a short, severe episode is referred to as a minute. A short, severe episode is referred to as terminal. Not terminal, right? Yeah, not terminal. So we can get rid of terminal. Short, severe. Got some answers in the chat. Yay, yes. B -b 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 -b. Love your answers. All right, you got it right. A short, severe episode is referred to as acute. So it's acute, it's intense, it's severe, it's an episode. Chronic is not short, it's usually long. Chronic comes and goes. All right. Terminal has nothing to do. Terminal is a different diagnosis and minute isn't really um, part of our terminology. Okay. Which of the following statements regarding the radius and ulna is correct? Okay, we just took a look at this. Gonna have to put on, use some critical thinking here. So we're looking for what is correct. So, so three of these statements are incorrect. So both are the same size. Both articulate with the humerus at the elbow joint. The radius is longer than the ulna. It is the home of tennis and golfer's elbow. So which is the which of the following statements regarding the radius and the ulna is incorrect? What do we know is definitely not right? Is the radius longer than the ulna? Maybe you can't remember. Are they both the same size? They're actually not. They almost look like they're the same size, but they're not. All right, oh, I see all sorts of, okay, let's see. Ooh, A is not right, correct. A is incorrect. And let's find another incorrect answer. 
So what's not true about the radius and outlook? Do they both articulate? What does articulate mean? Do we remember? That articulate means a joint. So they talk to. It's, I think of it as like, if I'm articulating something, I'm explaining something. So when they articulate, they talk to each other. They, they touch. So do both the radius and the ulna articulate with the humerus? Hmm. If you don't know, let's go to letter C and see if we can figure that out. The radius is longer than the ulna. Is that right? Okay, let's see, let's see, what do we got? Ooh. So we're looking for the best answer, right? So we're gonna have to go back to our slides and take a look at that. So most, most of you guys are picking the humorous, uh, both of them articulate. Think about where is that articulation? Yep, okay. So is the radius longer than the ulna? Mm -mm. Sure ain't. So we can get rid of A and we can get rid of C. And then, so I want to show, I show my, um, okay, I'll go back to those in a minute. All right. And so the correct answer in my book is letter D because the radius and the ulna are both the home of tennis and golfer's elbow. But let's take a look and see. Uh, I'm going to stop this share for just a moment. And we're going to take a look at, um, the radius and ulna articulation points. So here's the truth. The radius articulates proximally at the elbow uh, um, and the radial notch. So I believe it is just the radius that articulates. I'll show you my screen here. And we'll learn together. So here is, um, oh, you are correct. They both articulate. The radius though, usually does a little circle. And so this is what I think of it as, but that doesn't show you the, there we go. So I will get back to you on that. I believe you are correct. We are in a situation where there might be two good answers, uh, but, uh, I will get back to you on the, my answer was that's the home of the tennis and golfer's elbow. And with the time in mind, I'll end our questions there for now. So the suspense, you'll have to go to the Patron board, the Patron site and, uh, and look it up and see is, does the radius and the ulna uh, to articulate with the humorous? The story yet unfolds. All right, so my name again is Jody Skulls. Thanks so much uh, for the time that you've spent today going through anatomy of the upper limb, the joints, the, all those bony landmarks, all those muscles. Yay, you know the shoulder so much more now. You know that anatomy so much better now. Um, and it, it will serve you well with your continuing ed and it will serve you well uh, with your, your test as well with your MBLEX test. Uh, so I'm gonna sign off for now. I'm gonna stay on with the people who are live in class to take questions, um, answer, some, uh, answer some questions, give some feedback. But again, my name is Jody Skulls. It's my pleasure to be your instructor in this MBLEX review course. And I look forward to seeing you again um, in a future class.